more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Come on, say no more. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. No more chains, no more bondage, I am free, yeah. No more shackles. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage, I am free, yeah. Hallelujah. chains. Hallelujah. We're here this morning to raise a hallelujah to the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we will sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder this morning. Amen. In the presence of my enemy, and I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. You see, my weapon is a melody. Hallelujah. 
the king of my heart. Be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good, you're good. Oh, you are good, you're good. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king
gonna let me down. Worship you, Lord Jesus. You are good. God, you're so good to us. We worship you. We love you. We thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh God, you're so good. 
Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise in this place. You know, very often, what you experience when you come into a sanctuary has as much to do with what's going on in you as what's going on in the sanctuary. And I don't know if it's what's happening in here or what's happening in me, but I guarantee you, I feel the presence of God in this place. I'm going to be honest with you, I can't remember the last time I was touched that deep. God is so good. Amen. Say that with me. God is so good. Woo! Let's say it. He is good to me. Huh? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'm very excited this morning. You know, we've been setting up a path to leadership here at OBT where you come in and you come in and make yourself at home. We have visitors here today and, you know, we haven't been recognizing visitors or handing out visitor pamphlets because this whole COVID thing, we're trying to, trying to limit, you know, any kind of contact and so forth. I can tell Dalton's still got the spirit, amen. And uh, oh, what a blessing he is. But you come in and you do a taste of OBT, and we've had a few of those. And if weather's you know, permissible, we may do another one. Uh, but right now, we have some people who want to go to the next level, and that is join OBT. And then you commit in OBT, and then you lead in OBT. So there's a path from walking in the door. And of course, we don't have to follow that exact formula. We have mature people that already have established ministries that come. And, but we're wanting to set that up so a person can come through the door, get saved, and end up in leadership. And so we have a mixture of people coming today. Some are very mature. Some are coming from other churches. Some are recently been saved and so forth. And uh, the, the names that I have a list of, I'm going to call. I want you all to come on up front, but it's not limited to these. You know, I'm talking about if you've been through a taste of OBT or you say, you know what, this is where I know God is calling me to plant myself. In Psalms 92, starting in verse 12, it says this. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord. You know, God has gifts that he wants to work through your life. He has a plan and a purpose for you. And he has a local body where he is going to reveal his whole plan for your life through. And when you plant yourself in the house of the Lord, this is what happens. Those who plant themselves in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. And all the old folks said, Amen. They shall be fresh and flourishing, says all the young folks, giving Amen. To declare that the Lord is upright, He is my rock, and in Him there is no right righteousness in Him. So, you know, I know that a lot of you came here with me. Some of you I have relationships with for 30 years. We came from Livingstone. 
You know, I know a lot of you are from OBT that were here long before we got here. You know, you're already members, but if something in you says, you know what, I see that God is doing something new, you're more than welcome to join those I'm about to call forth. Amen? All right, here we go. Gary and Faith Ann Fletcher. Amen. Sandy Terry. Joe Lehman. Lloyd and Dee Burgess. Jeanette Henson. Tina and Warren Carwile. Gary Davis and Teresa Davis. Phil Hobus, and those are the ones I have names for. Now, if you want to come up here and join, some of you new believers and so forth, you see me staring at y'all over there, David. If any of y'all want to come up and do this, you are more than welcome. Come on up. Brand new believers, church. Brand new believers. Amen. Come on up, Mavis. Hallelujah. Woo, am I glad to see Teresa up here. Amen. Amen. All right. Keisha. Hey, Keisha, man. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Oh. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Look at Dalton. Yeah, might want to come down on this end a little bit or something. I don't know. There's Mama right there. Uh, I guess what? Y'all spread down just a little bit. Spread down just a little bit. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Isn't God good, church? All right. Here we go. This is what belonging to a church is really all about. Having repented of our sins and being led by the Holy Spirit to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, at that moment you belong to the church. Amen? And we do both solemnly and joyfully enter into a covenant as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Ghost to walk together in Christian love. That's what this is about. Okay, you're making a commitment. You know what? This is going to be my family of God right here. Amen? Amen. You can give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So we're going to walk together in Christian love, holiness of heart and life, to promote prosperity and spirituality of the church, to be faithful to the worship services. That's what happens when you plant yourself. Amen? To contribute cheerfully. That's the only ones we're interested in. You'll never see this church try to talk you into giving anything. Contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry and other expenses of the church. Be willing to help the poor. Be willing to participate in spreading the gospel to all nations. You know, when you tithe here at this church, you already do that. I'm so excited. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the tithe of the tithe that we released just yesterday. But we released, we released, we're supporting six missionaries this, this quarter, guys. Hey, Amen. Go ahead. You can give the Lord a hand clap of praise. But I want to look around you. And church, I want you to look at these people as I read this next part. See, we further engage and commit to watch over one another in brotherly love. To pray for one another. To aid one another in distress. And let me tell you, part of that is making sure the staff knows what's going on in people's lives. You know, sometimes we don't know, you know, and we're going to set up more and more ways to do that. But when you know there's a brother or sister in need, you need to make sure that we know that. Amen? To make every effort to be sympathetic and courteous in speech and behavior and to be slow to take offense. But if we do offend or are offended, we will always be ready for a speedy reconciliation that we may maintain a spirit of unity in the body of Christ here at OBT. 
Now, if you agree with that, I want you to say, by the grace of God, I shall. Church, raise your right hand this way. Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, here we stand on November 25th. The 25 being the number of double grace. And I pray double grace upon these people. Double anointing. Double, double grace to carry out the plan that you have for their lives. I pray, Lord God, that you just continue to reveal to them the plan you have for their lives. May everywhere they place their foot be holy ground. May every word they speak be breathed by your Spirit. Father God, may you knit them together, fit them together in the body as you please. May you pour out the gifts upon them that you choose. May you, God, let them not only experience our love in their life today, but Lord God, may they experience yours. And Lord, I just want to thank you for bringing us together in the name of the only one who's ever made that possible. And that is in the name of your precious son, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Welcome into this family, church. God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. Amen. Oh, man. That was as much fun as dedicating babies and doing weddings right there, boy. Amen. Were there? Amen. Mavis said she thinks she met. She counted 25. It was, uh, it was Sandy Terry that was telling me, hey, I want to join the church on November 25th. That's the number of double grace. I said, amen, we're going to have to make that happen. Amen? Amen. If you've been around here, you know what grace really means. It's not just unmerited favor. It's the divine influence. It's the power of God in your life. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, also, I just want to pray over the offering this morning. Uh, because of COVID, you know, we don't pass around a plate or anything. There are two tables in the back of the church, and you can give whenever you feel led. But I do want to pray over that today. Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, I want to thank you for the gifts that are given today that are brought to your table, laid at your feet, to bring glory to your name. And so, Lord God, I pray for this church as a staff and elders that we be good stewards of all that you trust us with, that every dime will be used to bring glory to the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I already know what you're going to do in the life of the believers. For you tell us that you're going to return it, pressed down, shaken, and overflowing. And we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to express our love and our trust in you. For your word says that where our treasure is, our heart is. So we present our heart to you today, and we thank you for the opportunity, because apart from you, we wouldn't have anything to return. And we thank you for that in the name of your precious son, Jesus, and all God's people said... Amen. 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 So we had some people come today and children are now checking in down at Children's Church. There is a nursery uh, back behind the fellowship hall for those of you if you're not aware of that. And if you need some help, someone will help you find all of that. Amen. Our bonfire got rained out Saturday night. Man, wasn't that something? Boy, there's no question whether it was rained out or not, was it? Boy, it was pouring down rain. So they are going to do that on Wednesday night right after classes take place. The youth will be down there having their class probably out there on the field, and then everyone is invited to come down. So if you'd like to join us this Wednesday night, we will do that. All right. You ready to get in the Word of God? What time is it? All righty, man. Here it is. We've been talking about the two most important books that you need to have your name in. Amen. And it's not the church role, amen? It's the church role in the Lamb of God, amen? And the second one is the book of remembrance. Why? Paul says we always aim to be pleasing to Him, for we must all stand before the judgment seat of God. And so the things that we do are going to be tried by fire. And so some are going to last and some are not. It's not always what you do, sometimes it's how you do it. We were talking about Cornelius last week. Cornelius was a, a Gentile who was a devout man, a man who feared God, and his alms and his prayers came up as a remembrance or memorial before God. What does that tell you? They were recorded, amen? Then we looked at how Jesus talks about giving and praying. 
He says that there's a way that you give. If you give so everybody will see you, that's it. There's no reward. It's not written down. It won't withstand the fire. Uh, your prayers, if you do those for the wrong reason, I'm talking about they are not recorded. And so what I want to talk to you today about is true riches. True riches. What's a true rich? You know, God says don't store up riches here on earth where rust and moth destroy. Those aren't true riches. They perish. Right? He says store up treasures in heaven where rust and moth are nothing destroys. That's what we're after today, church. We're after the true riches of God. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, I'm asking you right now to send the true teacher, the Holy Spirit of God, into this place. Lord, I'm asking you to open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth of your word. I'm asking you, Lord God, to give us wisdom to apply it. Oh God, the faith to walk in it. That Lord, that when we walk out these doors, we'll be better prepared to serve you than when we came. May when we lay our heads on our pillow tonight, know surely we've been in your presence. And so we thank you for that in the name of your precious son Jesus. And all God's people said one more time, Amen. Amen. So when you want to talk about true riches, to actually be able to get your mind around it, we have to talk about earthly riches. And you know, we understand the principle that you look at the natural to understand the spiritual. Amen? But when it comes to riches, it goes even deeper than that. Okay? I'm talking about how we handle earthly riches actually opens the door to the true riches of life. And so we're going to be talking about money today, so I know it's going to get very quiet in here today. And the reason it gets very quiet when you talk about money is because it's not about money, it's about your heart. All right? I'm talking about Matthew 16, 21. Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart is. So when you start talking about money, people start getting real uncomfortable. Okay? Don't worry, I'm not taking up an offering. God is good. We're not lacking for anything. I'm not after your gift in any situation, form, or fashion. Amen? What I am after is standing beside you at the judgment seat of Christ and watching you be rewarded. That's all I care about. Amen? All right. But here's the point. The Bible mentions the word money 800 times. But if you talk about all the parables and the time that money is used to teach us lessons, there's actually 2,000 verses that have to do with money. Why? Once again, it's a reflection of your heart. Amen? And that's what God is after. He's after your heart. I got news for you. He's already got your money. Okay, the only reason you got any money is because He let you have it. Amen? Or made the opportunity. So He's not after. Okay? And I promise you, I'm not either. Amen? But once again, I want to go back to the book of Malachi. And in the book of Malachi, you know, the Old Testament is not necessarily written in chronological order. As a matter of fact, it's not. Okay? Like the book of Job is considered the oldest book in the Old Testament. But when it comes to the book of Malachi, he actually was the last inspired writer of Scripture until the New Testament, until John the Baptist came, and then Jesus came. And there was 400 years of silence because the people of God had drifted so far away. And as we stand here, and I know Jesus is about to come soon, we've been talking about what time it is, we find ourselves in very much the same condition. And so that's where we've been talking about the book of remembrance and so forth. Fourth, But when the book of Malachi starts out, you can tell that God is just picking up on a conversation with the people of God. The way he begins the first verse is he says, I have loved you. So what does that tell us? People are questioning God's love for them. And why are they questioning God's love for them? Because they are not prospering in any shape, form, or fashion. And they recognize something is wrong. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever been going along and you, can't, you, know, you don't know how you're going to pay a bill and then something else happens and then the car tears up and you start thinking, God, don't you love me? See, we know on a level that treasure is connected to hearts. You feel like when God's not there, there for you financially, you start questioning love. I got news for you. Finances have absolutely nothing to do with God's love for you. But it has everything to do with your love for Him. Okay? So in Malachi, here's what happened. And you tell me if you don't see what's going on in our nation and in the body of Christ today. In Malachi 1.4, it says this. There's an attitude that the people have. And it says, even though Edom, that's the descendants of, of Esau, even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished. 
Now, impoverished means somebody's made you poor. Doesn't mean just something's happened. They recognize they've been impoverished. That I'm talking about something's happened from on high that has made us poor. But here's their reaction. But we will return and build the desolate places. In other words, instead of repentance, they said we're going to rebuild. Come on now. Instead of, because God's always looking for repentance. Remember 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14 says this, that whenever I send drought, whenever I send pestilence, whenever I send a pestilence, what is that? COVID is a pestilence. Whenever I send these things, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal their land. But we have an attitude in this nation that when something goes wrong, instead of repentance, we're just going to rebuild. I'm talking about when 9-11 happened, the church is filled up for about two weeks. Right? There was no real repentance. And so what happened? We rebuilt, we rebuilt. 2008, the economy's running along. What happened? Bam. See, let me show you the rest of this verse. Here's the rest of it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I'll throw it down. They shall be called the territory of the wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. So we rebuild after 9-11, and you could go on back and see this happening. And then boom, 2008 hits, and I saw no repentance anywhere. So I'm talking about we rebuilt in January of this year. We had the strongest economy in the history of the world, most say. Lowest unemployment, unemployment ever. And I'm talking about pestilence comes, and now we're still waiting to see how much repentance is going to take place in this nation. But listen, when you talk about things like this, it can apply to a nation. And listen, you and I have no control over that apart from God releasing revival and people repenting. But if it applies to a nation, it also applies to a family. It applies to a business. It applies to the individual. So no matter what's going on around, you and I do not have to live in that cycle. Come on, I'm going to say that again. You and I do not have to live in that cycle because we serve a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And when the shaking comes and you see it now, things are being removed because they weren't really built on that solid foundation. And other things are flourishing. Amen? Okay. But sometimes it's not just what we do. It's what we do in light of other things that we do. This is where it's going to start getting quiet. Okay? Here's what, Mal- here's what God says through the prophet Malachi. He says this in Malachi 1.6, A son honors his father, and a servant honors his master. If I am then the father, say the father. You know it's not just a father, right? He is the father. Where is my honor? If I'm really a master, where is my reverence? See, in other words, you give reverence to your boss. You show up on time when you get to work. You get all the kids ready to go to school. But then you can't get to church at 11 o'clock. See, it's not just what you do, it's what you do in light of. You know, one of the things that really got me with this COVID was when they were, everybody was shutting down churches. And, and I understand that. We walked through this thing. We never shut our doors. Praise God. And, but, you know, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And, and no one in the church or coming from church has gotten sick, not one. We had a family who went on vacation and caught it. Okay? You know, the pastor and me wanted to say he should have been in church. No. But good news is they've come through it, and they're, they're doing fine. And they were with family, so that's important too. Amen. But, you know, when I would see people saying, well, you know, I'm afraid to go to church, but then they'd be down here at a restaurant. You know, and you're trusting people behind closed doors to prepare your food, but you can't walk in the house of God. There's something wrong. Now, here's what he says in the rest of this verse. Says the Lord of hosts to you priests. And you might say, okay, he's talking to the priest. How many of you know that we're a royal priesthood? So we all hold that position. So he's talking to all of us. 
All right? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. And you say, well, I would never despise God's name. And he said, look what he says next. He already knows you're going to say that. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Well, you know what it means to despise his name? His authority in your life. Name represents authority. That's why I just prayed in Jesus' name. It's not by my authority. I can't do anything. It's Jesus. Jesus' name. You've despised my authority in your life, my right to say how you should live and how you should do things. And how were they despised in the name? Malachi 1 7 says, You offer defiled food on my altar. But you say, In what way have we defiled you? And you do that by saying, The table of the Lord is contemptible. So, what is the table of the Lord? It's those two tables right there in the back. Okay, the table of the Lord is where they would bring their sacrifices. Now, what does it mean to be contemptible? It, it means that you just give it no respect. You consider it something common, something not to be desired. You know, if, if we were still passing the plate around, and, and when we put the, the receptacles in the back, and you thought, boy, I'm glad they're not passing that plate anymore, you just need to take a look at that. Okay, because the table of the Lord is something to be desired. I was very excited about giving my offering today because God blessed me unexpectedly, so I got to give more than usual. Okay? And but see, that's the whole point of it. You wouldn't have anything to give them if he didn't give it to you. Okay? And so here's how they're saying that the Lord is contemptible. All right, here we go. Verse 8. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? In other words, when you give what you don't really care about, something that's really not a sacrifice at all, the leftovers, something that, that you consider contemptible to begin with. Okay? In other words, it's like, let's say, keep numbers simple. You make $500, come into church, ain't no, no way I'm going to give $50 to God. Uh-uh, i got to have that. And then you go to a restaurant and spend $50. Okay? And then you give a waitress 15 or 20% to bring it to you. But you can't give God 10%? Come on now. I mean, it's the same thing. And look at this. In light of, here's what he says. Malachi 1.8. Offer it then to your governor. In other words, I tell you what, treat the IRS like you treat me. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? You know, there's a lot of people that have the first fruits taken out of their check, right? The first fruits taken out by the government have no problem with it. But you can't walk in here and give God 10%, which is supposed to be the first fruits. I mean, that's why I, that's why I always tithe on my gross, okay? Not on my net, okay? I'm talking about it's supposed to be the first fruits, okay? I'm talking about, I'm just sharing with you personally. I found this makes a difference too because of the culture in which we live. I'm telling you what you do. You know, people say, well, I can't afford to tithe. That's impossible. It's the first 10%. So if you got a dollar, then you can afford to tithe because you got a whole dollar. All it wants is a dime. And I found that, you know, it makes a difference if you write your tithe check first before you open your bills. Watch the difference. You watch the difference. Mm -mm -mm. And he says this by the time you get to Malachi 3 8. Will a man rob God? And you say, Oh, there's no way. How could you rob God? He says, Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? Have you ever been robbed? I've been robbed. I deserve to be robbed, but I got robbed. <laughs> it's very demeaning. Okay, it's very demeaning when someone beats you down and takes your stuff. I see a hand up over there. I'm talking about it's very demeaning. God's saying that's the way you make me feel. Okay? And he says, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Okay? Now look what it says next. Malachi 3, 9. It says, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, a few weeks ago, we put up the debt clock. If you've never seen the debt clock, Google it. United States of America debt clock. And watch how fast we're just traveling in debt. There's going to be a reckoning. But the problem with the debt clock is not just wasteful spending. The people we put in office to, to waste our money is a reflection of the church. The reason, I, I'll give you an example. Right now, 
you're watching the elections coming up, and they're all talking about health care, health care, health care, health care. Well, you know why health care is a problem? Because the church gave it up. The church was a health care. We started Good Samaritan down here, right down 1.3 miles down the road. By the way, they were here Thursday and Friday. We signed up another 122 families that we're going to be taking care of. We had we have 46 full-time employees. We're about to have 49. We got 128 volunteers. And whenever you give $100 to Good Samaritan, we give $1,500 worth of medical care. Now, what does that mean? That means if the church, just that one example that we have down the road, you would reduce health care, would only cost 7% of what it costs now. What would that do to the budget of the United States of America? If you could reduce 93%. Come on now. And it's because the church isn't there. That's why all the hospitals are called St. Jude, right? St. Joseph's. I mean, talking about the Georgia Baptist Hospital went under because there's not enough Baptist tithing, I reckon. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just what's happening. The, the church fed the people. Now we have to have food stamps because the church gave it up. Church took care of the elderly. Now we have to have Medicare because the church isn't doing its job. Okay, the whole nation's under a curse because the church isn't doing what it should be doing. And God's kingdom's not lacking for anything. So what we've done is we have relinquished our, our responsibility. And when you relinquish your responsibility, you, use your, you lose your authority. So when COVID hit, churches are considered non-essential. Liquor stores, now those are essential. Marijuana stores, those are essential. But I'm talking about, but church was considered non-essential. Thank God we got a president that stood up and said, oh, yes, it is. But he can only do that on a federal level. There's all kinds of people that are going to have to go to state court and everything. I'm talking about there's churches facing huge fines, thousands of dollars a day, and they're trusting in this election to take place because if the pendulum swings the other way, help is not coming. It's not as quiet as I thought it was going to get. Now, here's what God says. Now, here's the good news. Say, here's good news. All right, so we got some good news. God's always got good news. Okay, so here's the good news. And here's how you can change your life, your family, your business. He says this, Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithes. Say, all the tithes. We're not talking about leftovers, 2%, 5%. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, here's the mind boggler. And try, na- try me now. Say, try me now. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, he says, test me. You know, there's nowhere else in the Bible that says that. You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. You better not go out here and get down on your knees in all still road and trust in God to rescue you from a coming car. You're going to get run over. Most likely. He might, he might because, you know, you're crazy or whatever. But the point is, you know, he's graceful to the fools, right? But, but the point is, there's one time when God says, you want to test me, you want to see me move in your life. There's one time he says you can do it. And why does he choose money? Because it's your heart. Get your eyes off the dollar signs and get your eyes on your heart. That's why he says, you want to test me? You want to test my heart? Then you just show me your heart. I don't want to hear about it. I want to see it. Okay, and here's what he says. Here's his challenge. The rest of the verse says this. See if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will be not room enough to receive it. Now, I've heard people say, what do you mean? You can always put another zero on my bank account. Get your mind off the dollars. The dollars are a reflection of your heart. We're talking about windows of heaven here. We're talking about true riches. We're talking about something way beyond what money can buy. But yes, money's part of it. It's hard to really be filled with joy and peace if you can't pay for your children's food. 
So money is part of it, but that's not what we're after. Okay? That's not what God is after. He says, you want to see me work in your life? He says, you trust me with that. And I want you to notice something. He says, he says that, how have you robbed me in tithes and offerings? But then he only says, bring the whole tithe in the storehouse. What does that mean? The tithe is commanded. That's first mile Christianity. Anything short of that, you're out of, you're out of obedience. An offering is free will. I get to decide what I make in offerings. Okay, so the tithe is just, it's just part of my life. And then, but I, I never just tithe, ever. Okay, because when you step into that second mile, God starts doing some of the wildest stuff. I mean, the wildest stuff. I mean, it's just like I told you, I've had some unexpected blessings. Okay, well, you know what happened? I get the unexpected blessings, and I get a bill for our Israel trip. So God just paid for it. That's the way he does. Okay? Oh, my goodness. Y'all going to get this in a minute. Let's go over to the New Testament, and let's just talk about this for just a minute. Okay? So while we're talking about more than money, it's still money, and how we handle money is a reflection of what we can handle in the true riches. If you can't handle something simple like money, what are you going to do with true riches? All right, and here's, here's a test, here's a principle, here's something that will change your life if you'll ever just get it. And it comes from Luke 16, 10 through 11. He says this, But he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, what is that? That's untithed money. It's unrighteous and it's money. Money, mammon means money. So if I've given $100 and I'm not faithful with that unrighteous mammon, in least, what's least? The tithe. Okay? Come on now. It's only 10%. So I've got unrighteous mammon and I can't be trusted to be faithful in what is least. Who will commit to you the true riches? Say true riches. If I can't handle something physical, how am I going to handle the spiritual? Okay, and here's the point. If you're unfaithful in what is least, it's like the parable of the talents. We're going to look at them a little bit, not in depth. But you roll backwards, you lose what you have because you can't handle it. Okay, but when you're faithful in something, it's like God training you to receive more. I mean, I'm talking about, okay, ministry. Parents with a Purpose became Mission 127. It started in my basement. My first two volunteer employees were Chelsea when she was about eight years old and her brother Shane when he was nine. I got pictures of those two children sweating in the basement helping me unload trucks full of presents because we had no warehouse. I'm working 12 hours a day, six days a week. And I'm talking about we would fill that basement all the way up to the roof then we couldn't afford a truck, so I'd take the truck back. Then I had to bring it back, reload it, bring it back and wrap it. Now we got two trucks out in the parking lot, running every single day. And if we need three, God will send it. We had no place to put it. Next thing I know, we got a 50,000 square. First, we went from there to Lori Meredith's basement. She had a bigger basement than I did. I mean, we're dragging, we're loading transfer trucks in her subdivision. Okay, dragging stuff through her front yard. Then we go to the basement of an apartment building, building 300 at Walton Grove. Then we end up 50,000 square feet for free. Okay, I'm just, I'm not, please don't think I'm bragging. I'm trying to tell you how it works. You know how that ministry began? Selling t-shirts. Selling Christian t-shirts, making $7.50 for every t-shirt. Okay? I don't know if I should start calling out numbers since we're on Facebook and publicly, but the budget's in the millions. Okay, they just came from being trusted with this so God trusts you with more. And it doesn't matter where you start. Listen, I know two millionaires that their first tithe check was a dollar. Tithe gift, not check. They both had $10. One of them had 11 It was $1.10. And both of them ended up being millionaires. One of them lost his way and lost everything he had. Another one never has, and it's astronomical what God's doing through the sky, but you'll never know. You know why? Because he gives in secret. So God rewards him openly, so you really have no idea what the numbers are. Okay? I'm talking about, but it begins with being trusted with what is least. Now look at this, the next two verses, 12 and 13. If you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Now that's something physical to look at. 
If you don't pay your rent, who's going to mortgage you a house? Nobody. Okay, if I, if I can't be trusted in what's another person's, nobody's going to give me what's my own. But now we get into the spiritual side of it. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise. Remember he said you despise my name? You'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot, say cannot, serve God and money. You cannot serve God and mammon. Why? Because your heart's divided. Okay, you have got, if you're going to really serve God, you need to get this area of your life in place. And there's freedom. We just sang that song about being free. Man, I felt so free in this place. And see, it's just like in worshiping God. I can remember when I first got saved, I go into a church service, and I'm talking about, I, I wasn't raising my hands. And then I raised one hand, I thought, ooh, that feels pretty good. <laughs> if you have never raised your hand in worship, I, I promise you, raise both hands in worship and see what you feel. <laughs> it's not about raising your hands, it's about freeing yourself up. That's what handling finances is, it's freeing you up so you can receive the true riches of God. There's a freedom in it, Amen. It's the same struggle, you know, money is a reflection, or you can really see it in the same struggle found in Galatians 5, 16, and 17. It says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit. And if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How many of you know money is connected to the flesh? See, so when you're giving up that money, you're giving up flesh. It's like fasting. You start bringing that, that, that flesh under control. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh these are contrary to one another so you do not do the things that you wish we're talking about true riches we could talk about a lot I mean, we're going all day i don't know if god's going to let us off of this today or not but i mean you know what's one of the great what's the true rich salvation i mean sozo is not just being rescued from hell it's being healed it's being delivered i mean what about grace I'm not talking about it is unmerited favor. You can't earn it. But that divine influence in your heart that sets you free from sin, because no matter how bound up you are in sin, grace abounds much more. The power of the Holy Ghost in you is far greater than anything that's got its hold on you. You can be set free. You don't have to. I had a discussion today. You know, they call drug addiction a disease. So whenever I received that, I, did, I never bothered to look up the word disease. I just got I attitude. I said, well, you don't persecute people for drug addiction. I mean, you don't persecute people for cancer. You don't persecute people for leukemia. You're not going to persecute me because I'm a drug addict. Right? All disease means is a destructive process in a living organism. I was giving myself my disease, and God can heal it. I mean, set you free that's a true rich of god amen what about healings what about gifts of the spirit okay but i want you to show you in the talking about the fruit of the spirit how much of that can be reflected in how we handle finances it's pretty amazing all right for example galatians 5 22 through 23 which is a list of the characteristics of a fruit that is a true rich okay the fruit of the spirit is love Okay, you say you can't buy love? Absolutely you can't buy love. But you know what the number one cause of divorce is? I googled it just to make sure it still was. Finances, money. It's the number one reason that people fall out of love. What is love? It's a decision. And so you could say it's the stress, it's the arguments, it's infidelity. But when you get back to the root of it, somebody's unfaithful with mammon. And it causes the stress, it causes divorce. Number one cause, joy. Can't buy happiness. Man, you can have a ton of money and be miserable. But wait till you see how joy is tied to how you handle finance. I'm going to show you in just a minute. I'm talking about, and it's hard to have joy. See, it doesn't come from money, but it's hard to have it. God will use financial, what's the next one? Peace. Come on, Misty, financial peace. She teaches financial peace. You, what does peace mean? It means nothing missing, nothing broken. And so if you're all crossed up with God because your heart's all messed up and you're suffering financially, it's hard to have peace because there's something missing. And if something's broken, you don't have the money to fix it. 
Okay, so it, ha- it is t- attached to it, but it can't buy peace. But God uses it in your peace. It can't buy joy, I promise you. I've had suitcases of money and I was not happy. Okay, but I'm talking about God uses finances to keep my joy just running over. And I don't mean some big bank account. I'm talking about peace, just like when in one minute you get an unexpected blessing and the next minute comes an unexpected bill and there's nothing missing, nothing broken. Come on now. And if you don't have that, there's not a one of you who can't. God says, test me now in this. Okay. So here's another one, all right? Long-suffering patience. God will train you up financially in patience. Did you know the number one common denominator among self-made millionaires? I'm reading it in a book one day on a plane, and I'm thinking, you know, some kind of knowledge or something like that is patient. They're patient. They don't have to have it right now. It's the number one common denominator among wealthy people is patience. Kindness. You know what that is? That's actually the word volunteer. That's why when somebody gets saved and the Holy Spirit comes in them, they start wanting to volunteer. They want to volunteer like Tina was up here today, by the way, and Warren's not with her because he's down there volunteering in the children's church or youth house one. He's already gone from join to commit before I could even get him up here. Okay, well, what is that? That's not normal. I never wanted to go feed people till I got saved. But listen, you don't think the finances bring joy so you can give and volunteer and bless and do things for free instead of expecting a paycheck and things like that? Oh, absolutely. Goodness. You know what goodness is? Being good to folks. Man, I'm talking about it's a great tool. See, let me tell you something. Money is a great tool, but a horrible master. I'm talking about it is a great servant, but a horrible ruler. Okay? I'm talking about faithfulness, all right? I'm talking about, well, that's what we talk about. If you can be faithful in what's least, you can be faithful in much. Gentleness, self-control. Buddy, I'm talking about if you want to know if somebody's got self-control, just take a look at their bank account, okay? Once again, it's not just about the money. What's in their bank account is a reflection of what's going on in here. Yeah. All right, so here we go. Parable of the talents, one of my favorite parables, and I'm going to try not to get too deep into it. But I just want you to see something here, okay? Matthew 25, 14 through 15. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. So God's about to show us something spiritual by getting us to look at something natural. So the kingdom of heaven, which you can't see, is like a man you can see traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. So the kingdom of heaven, of course, is exactly that. Who's the person that has servants? Jesus, we're servants of his, amen? And he delivers something to us. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. This applies in many areas of life, whether it's how you can sing, lead worship, things like that. But this is talking about money. Okay? Because money is a reflection of everything you're going to trust God with. Okay? And each one according to his own ability. How did he determine the ability? I promise you, I don't have time today, but I can show you. The guy with the one talent is just getting started. The guy with the two talents has been faithful in one. The guy with the five talents has already been faithful with two. That's why I want God doesn't show show partiality. It tells you that in the book of Peter. Okay? And listen, you might say, hey, man, I'm telling you, I I, I had it tough, man. I, I, I come from a poor family. Well, you're not in a poor family no more. You're a child of God. I tell you, I came out of prison at 33 years old and I was broke, busted, but I wasn't disgusted. (laughs) Because I found the Lord, amen? (laughs) Woo! All right. And immediately he went on a journey, just like God's gone, Jesus is gone right now. But one day we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and that's what this is pointing to. It says this, Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. In other words, he invested in the kingdom of God. And likewise, he who received two gained two more also. But he who received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's what? Money. So no question what we're talking about here, even though the principle applies to other things. All right, verse 19 through 20. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came. I got news for you. He's coming and he's been gone for 2,000 years, but you don't have long. 
Okay? And he settled accounts with them. That's going to happen at the judgment seat. So he who received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I invested it. I did it the right way. I wasn't doing it so people could see me. I wasn't tooting my own horn. I just did what I felt like you wanted me to do. I have gained five more talents beside them. Now I want you to think about the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit in Matthew 25, 21. So his Lord said to him, well done, good. Come on now, goodness. Well done, good. And what? Faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things, just like in Luke. All right? So I've been able to trust you with more. Why? I'm going to, how do you know that? Because I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into the what? Joy of the Lord. You're not buying it, but there's a reflection going on inside of you how you handle things. But now I want you to see this. This is good news. Because you might say, well, man, I just got saved. I had not even had time to start. Pastor Grant keeps telling me Jesus is going to be here any day. Amen. Here's the good news, David. Why right, check this out. All right. Then he also, who received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have came to gain two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The exact same reward. Why? Because he was faithful with what he had. Whether it's small or it's big. You know, in America, we all, and I thought the same thing, bigger is better. No, better is better. All right? Here we go. Now, I tell you what, worship team, come on up here. And I, I want to share my heart with you for just a second, but I want to share with you some really good news. I'll tell you some really good news. I want to bring this thing in for a landing. We're coming in for a landing. And, you know, the Apostle Paul, uh, he is writing a letter to the Philippians. And here's what he says in Philippians 4, 15 through 17. He says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. So he only had one person supporting him in his ministry. One church supporting him. You know, we had Alex and Hannah up here, and we prayed over Alex and Hannah, and they're, they're there in Hawaii. They're getting themselves on the ground. They had to quarantine for 14 days. You know, we're going to let them get settled and things like that. They're about to find out whether God has really called them or not. And we're going to be the first church to support them. Okay, we released part of the time of the time to do that. There's a, another missionary couple, I believe it's the Doings, that actually OBT was their first supporter many years ago, and we still support them. Amen? But I want you to get this, okay? And I want you, I want you to get this, Okay? For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift. Don't you think I'm seeking the gift? I'm not seeking anything from you. I love you. And I want you guys to be ready because the second most important day in your life, unless you're not saved, if you're sitting here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the most important day in your life is the day your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So you can have the most important day in your life right here today. Okay, we're going to give you an opportunity in just a minute at this altar. Please don't walk out of this room without coming to know him in a personal way if you don't. But the second most important day is the day that you stand before him and give him an account of what you did with the life he paid for. Okay, and here's what it says. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. In other words, listen, please. I mean, anybody who knows me will tell you, I'm never after your money. God's got all we need. Okay? But I know God's after your heart. Okay? And when we join together in giving, all things go into your account. We're joined together in that. That's what he's saying. I'm not seeking what you're going to give me, but I am very excited because I know what God's doing through me. And now I'm talking about your, that goes on your account. So when I see Good Samaritan here and they sign up another 122 people and some of them were families and so forth, I'm excited because you gave to this church. This church supports Good Samaritan, plus we provided the gym that they could come and be here in, right? Our school, every child's life that's been affected in this church, you're part of, 
Why? Because you give to the church and the school that way doesn't have to pay any rent, no utilities, nothing like that. You're paying for all those kids to get a good Christian education. When you give to Mission 127 or we release a tithe of the tithe, all those people that they help, I mean, it's like, I don't even know what the numbers are this year. I mean, I can tell you, Good Samaritan, we helped 33,000 people last year. Every bit of that goes on your account. Mission 127, we take care of 420 children a day now. A day. They come mostly from single-parent families. They would be lock-key children if we weren't taking care of them. When those moving trucks are moving and out there showing the love of Christ, you're part of all that. What this church does to support you, you're part of all that. But I'd be amiss, amiss not to also point this out to you. Whatever you join yourself to knowingly and support goes on your account. Elections coming up. I'm talking about, I'm not after anybody's vote. I'm talking about, we're not going to sway any election here, but you need to be careful about what you attach yourself to. Personally, I'm not going to attach myself. And and get your minds off. Look, just like you need to get your mind off the money, get it on your heart. Get your mind off the people and get what it stands for. It's very clear you have a choice to support 62 million people being, 62 million children being aborted and much more. Or another party that's about to put in a a, a Supreme Court judge and who knows, we may be able to at least slow it down. I'm talking about you got one. I'm talking about you know that another person just came in on peace agreement? I'm talking about the Sudan just signed part of that peace agreement with Israel. Now, God's going to put in that office whoever he chooses. It tells you that in the book of Daniel. So nothing I say to you is going to change that. I'm not trying to change that. I'm concerned about you. I'm not seeking any gift or anything. I'm seeking what's going on to your account. You need to be very careful. You need to do a little bit of research before you attach yourself to something. And we're going to close with this, Philippians 4, 18 and 19. And here's what Paul shared, and this is exactly the way I feel. He says, I'm not after your gift. I'm, at, I, I'm excited about the fruit that abounds to you. You know why? He says, indeed, that means truly, I have all. Now, it doesn't, he didn't have any big bank account, but he has all and abounds. I'm full. He was full. That doesn't mean a bank account full. It means his cup running over. I'm talking about, I'm telling you, when you find freedom in Christ, he will fill you so full of joy, man. I'm talking about, he just come bubbling out. I'm talking about, man, you get so, I, there's been times I thought, man, I might explode. But I thought, God's not going to make me explode and make a big mess. So just pour it on. Okay? I'm full, having received from Aphrodite the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma. See, when we make a sacrifice to God, that's a sweet-smelling aroma, just like prayers. Prayers are sweet-smelling moments, so are your alms. An acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And here's what I want to close with. Because this is what will happen. If you get finances under control, which is a reflection you get in your heart under control, you don't have to, it doesn't matter who goes in the White House. It doesn't matter if you've been deceived by any of those people. You're not accountable for that if you've been deceived. It doesn't matter what goes on in this economy. It don't matter if another pestilence comes. I want you to see this with me. And my God, say my God, shall supply all your need. Say all your need. According to the economy, no. According to his riches. The true riches that he wants to open up the window and pour out so many on you, you won't be able to contain it. In glory by Christ Jesus. So Jesus is the one that makes it all possible. That's the door you've got to go through. But I mean, listen, I don't know about you, but I do not want to be dependent upon this crazy world. You take a look at that debt clock, man. I'm not putting my hope in that. Oh, my goodness. Come on up here, prayer team. Come on up here. We're going to open up this altar. Y'all stand together if you feel comfortable. We're going to worship together.
we're opening up this altar for you. If you do not know Jesus Christ, please come on down here. You know, you can pray to receive Christ right where you are. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins. And you can, you can pray to receive Christ right where you are, but there's something about coming down. Something about putting a nail in that decision. Just like standing up and joining a church. Something, but this is far more important, about doing that. If you're bound up by anything, you need to come down here and let's pray for you. So you can be set free. I'm talking about anything you want to pray about, we're about to open up this altar. If you realize, you know what, I haven't been able to trust God like I want to. I've just never been able to do it, and I want to be able to start trusting God. You know, come down here and pray about whatever it may be, and we're here to pray with you. Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, I pray for this congregation right now. I pray for everyone who's listening to us on Facebook right now. I pray, God, that your presence go right into their homes or wherever they may be watching, just like I feel your presence right here. I pray, Father God, that you just move upon us, that you guide and direct us in all that we do. I want to thank you that I can feel you standing still right here, just waiting for us to come to you. We thank you for that in the name of your precious son, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Let's worship together and you come as you feel led. I have a feeling that there's somebody in here that needs to pray about something, but they're embarrassed. I want you to know this is a safe place. I want you to know we never discuss who we prayed for or anything like that. This is a safe place. Don't you let the devil keep you in your seat.
Say, God is good. He is so good to me. Come on now, let's say it. He is so good to me. Amen. I just had a prayer request. A fellow that all of you at OBT know and known for a long time, Steve Anderson. He either needs a touch from the Lord or he's going to go be with the Lord as we speak. It's serious. And so we're going to pray for him, and I'm going to bless you, and you're going to have a wonderful day in the Lord. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, I want to thank you that right now you're looking at Steve. That right now you know exactly what's going on with him. Father God, you know his wife's heart. She wants to see him healed. She wants to see him walk out of there, Lord God. You know her heart. And so, Lord God, we lay him at the foot of the cross, and we trust in you to have mercy and compassion upon his life. And Lord God, I pray that you give his lovely wife a peace that surpasses understanding. And Lord, right now I ask you to bless everyone here in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. May your days be free from fear. May you be blessed with the spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind all the days of your life. As a deer panteth for the water, so may your souls long for him. May God guide and direct you in everything that you do. May he help you to be faithful in what is least because he wants to trust you with what is much. I pray that God give you the courage to let your light shine, that when men see your good works, they'll give your Father in heaven glory for it all. Now I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. God bless.